Good morning, everyone. So I hope you all enjoyed the last night's dinner and you are refreshed today to have a wonderful session on project proposal writing. It's uh, from National Science Fund, or FWF in short. So just, just I mean, I think Simone will uh, introduce more about the organization. So just to give you a brief uh, background, FWF is an organization, in, in my personal opinion, is one of the modern organizations who helps to progress the science. They are the, one of the first organizations who actually signed the, Ber uh, signed the Berlin Declaration, and you will see they have a lot of different uh, options on, on open science. So our first uh, speaker, or today's speaker, is Simon Ricci. He's a trained astrophysicist. Uh, after receiving his PhD in physics, he, he worked in University of Trieste. Also, sp he spent 12 years in research uh, in Germany, Austria, and Italy. So he has a lot of experience what you are going through today, as, a, as a, I hope, uh, as, a, as a participant. And then uh, he joined in Austrian Science Fund as a project manager in 2016, so where he actually uh, deals with the natural sciences and projects uh, for mobile researchers and women researchers. Uh, from, uh, since uh, 2018, he also started to give the workshop. So I actually met him in one of these workshops, so which was fantastic. It's pity that it's only one and a half hour today. It's not the full day. So the floor is all yours, so thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mustafa, for the nice introduction, and thanks for being here. So I hope you also enjoyed the dinner. I did. And uh, so, as Mustafa said, I'm working at the FWF as a project officer, so I follow application from the submission to the decision, which is not my decision, but at least I can give some advice to the board. So the aim of the presentation is to give you some overview of the FWF activities. I put my name in this slide, not because it's mo so important, but just to remark you that the FWF is here for you, for the applicants. So anytime you have some question, please send me an email, call me, and call other colleagues of mine at the FWF. We will cover some ground in this uh, presentation, but we will not cover that much ground. So for any open question or for mere, more detailed questions on applications for the FWF, just send us an email. I usually don't use the microphone. Usually I'm loud enough, so I'm apparently forced to use the microphone, so I hope it's okay for you. So what's the aim of this presentation? First of all, I would like to give you an overview, a very broad overview of the FWF activities, what we do, why we do that, and then I will give you some uh, more detailed information about the FWF programs, at least some programs which might be of interest for you. And then I will conclude with some uh, more detailed remarks on the application to the FWF. How does an application look like? What's, what are the aspects to pay attention to for an application to the FWF, and also some general indication about our decision procedures. So maybe you are interested at applying for the FWF, maybe you are not. So in this case, maybe the last part is the less interesting for you, but still I will later phrase it in a more general way, so maybe you will still find some useful indication suggestion, tip, that might be useful also for applications to other funding agencies. So, let's start with some general remark about the FWF. What is our mission? Our mission is essentially to promote high quality science in Austria and high quality basic science in Austria. So science aimed at developing new knowledge. So this is also a kind of misconception sometimes in some quarters about the FWF. Some people believe that we don't like applications, that a way to kill an application for the FWF is to mention practical application. That's not true. We love application. We love that basic science can be applied to real problems. It's just that our focus is on new knowledge. 
new basic knowledge. So possible practical applications are welcome, but are not decisive factors for the final funding decision. That's it. The other mission, the other important mission of the FWF is education and training through research. So we care about possible career developments, career development of the applicants, and we try to develop programs also for this aim. And the third mission is to try to create a bridge between science and the society as a whole. And we try to reflect these three missions in our funding portfolio. So these are our programs. There are a few of them, but not that many. So I hope this is more or less self-contained. And uh, there are a couple of programs, particularly the standalone, the Schrodinger, and the Meitner. I will talk more about later on. So the standalone is the typical, classical, self-contained uh, scientific project in which there is just one person, which is the principal investigator for this project. So I will say more about the standalone and more about the other mobility programs, Schrodinger and Meitner. So I will say a few words about the other programs. The international program is in the structure similar to the standalone, but of course there is the focus to the international collaboration. So there is one Austrian investigator and one investigator abroad in a partner country. We have collaboration with France, Germany, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Belgium, Russia, and so on. There are some 20 countries which are partner to the Austrian Science Fund and for which we have this kind of bilateral calls. The SFP, Special Research Programs, these are big programs. So here, scientists try to develop a big idea which cannot be developed by a single person. So here the consortium is made of at least five scientists, five to 15 scientists, trying to develop a long range project. So that can be found for eight years and uh, you can apply for up to one million a year. So this is a big program. If you get it, you have found a significant fraction maybe of your career, but still we can find just a few of them. We realized recently that there is a gap between the relatively small standalone projects and the big SFPs. So therefore we created last year the research groups. So this is something in between. Here there are five, uh, three to five people involved in different research institutes in Austria and they collaborate on a big but not that big project and we can fund it up to five years and you get 300,000 euros per year, per year if you get it. Start program, this is kind of analogous to the uh, ERC starting grant. There is also an academic age limitation. In our case, it's between two and eight years after the PhD. So you have to, be, to have some, but not that much, postdoc experience to apply for that. The program is for six years with a evaluation after three years and you get money practically to build your own group. So the idea is to foster your scientific independence and to build for the first time in your career your own research group. The Wittgenstein Award, this is not a proposal, so you cannot submit this kind of proposal. You have to be nominated for that. This is our so-called Nobel Prize for Austria. So it's also more generous than the Nobel Prize. You get 1.5 million euros if you get it. And yeah, it's kind of the final achievement of a scientific career. And if you get it, practically you can do with this 1.5 million, whatever you want, which you find, of course, scientifically significant. The second pillar, uh, human resources, is more my playground. Here there are the programs which I follow personally. So there is the Young Independent Research Group. 
So this is kind of analogous to the research group, also in the name of the program. The idea is to put together three to five young research, researchers working on a multidisciplinary field. So the difference with the research group is on the young, you have to have not more than five years postdoc experience, and therefore it's in this pillar of career development. Of course, if you forget it, that can be a real career boost for you, and on the multidisciplinary team of these projects. Doc funds, this is our PhD program. So a university or a, a group of universities can fund PhD students, up to 10 PhD students through this program. Then there are the mobility programs I will be talking about later on, the outgoing Schrodinger and the incoming Meitner. And then there are these two programs for female scientists, Richter and Fierberg. This is aimed at being a two-stage program in which at the beginning of your career, you apply for the uh, Hertha Fierberg program. So you find your place in an Austrian research institute and with the uh, Richter program, the idea is to get to the level of qualification sufficient to get the habilitation and to apply for a professorship at the end of the project. So that's the main idea. And the third pillar is aimed at kind of fostering a closer collaboration between science and society. So the two programs, Cliff and Peck, are actually kind of spin-off of the standalone project. The Cliff is aimed at fostering clinical research. And the Peck is our science, art-based science program. So this is not some program on the history of art or on the science of art, but just making science with some artistic methods or flavor. We support scientific publications, which mean publications in journals, but also books, monographies, proceedings of conferences, and so on. There is another science communication program. Unfortunately, this, this is not active at the moment, but this is a way to promote scientific results and to disseminate scientific results in an original way. So if you have original idea to disseminate your results, once we, we will activate this program again, you can apply for it. And then there is the top citizen science, which is a way to involve citizens in real scientific programs. So these are our programs, our portfolio, which we usually also order in this kind of staircase just to show you that we can follow your career, that it is possible to follow your career from the right at the beginning as a student up to the end when you are a famous professor and you get the Wittgenstein Award. Then we can find uh, PhD programs, we can support postdocs at the beginning and at, the, at an advanced career stage and we can also, of course, support more experienced scientists. So, that was our funding portfolio. And uh, what about the structure of the FWF? This is kind of the heart of the FWF. There is on one side the board, which is made of university professors in Austria. They represent different disciplines and we subdivide the disciplines between natural sciences, biology and medicine, and social sciences and humanities. And you see, we need 20 uh, reporters for the natural sciences, 20 for the biology and medicine, and 16 for the social sciences and humanities. They are less, not because we think that the social sciences and humanities are less important, they are not, definitely, but there are less applications on these fields. So therefore, we need less reporters. And then there are we, the normal workers at the FWF. So we are about 120 at the moment, two-thirds of which 
are really dealing with applications, like me, we really follow applications. And then there is one third which are in uh, yeah, service departments, legal department, IT, uh, financial department, and so on. So this was a broad overview on the FWF activities. Now a few more words on these three specific programs I outlined at the beginning. So the standalone, the Schrödinger, and the Meitner. The standalone is the classical self-contained scientific program in which you can develop one scientific idea and there is one person responsible for this project. Of course, this person don't doesn't have to do everything alone. Of course, he or she can hire students, PhD students, postdoc, he or she can collaborate with collaborators in Austria or abroad, but he or she is responsible and the principal investigator for this project. There is a limitation to four years. We used to have, until a couple of months ago, also a cap in the money you can apply for, put at 400,000 euros. This was because our budget was quite limited. We discovered that people are very clever, so 90% of the application were for 399,999 euros. So in the end, the cap didn't have so much effect on the amount of money people requested for. So we removed the cap. But you will see in the next slide that this has some consequences in the number of reviews you need for your application. The Project leader has just one constraint. We need that the project leader has, at the moment of the submission, at least two peer-reviewed publications. This is like that for almost all of our programs. And there is a second constraint in the case you are a so-called independent applicant. That means you apply for your own money. So if you want to apply for your own salary, we require you to be based in Austria. The nationality plays no role whatsoever, but what plays a role is where are you been working. If you have been working continuously for at least two years in Austria, or if you have been based at least three years in the last 10 in Austria, then you are eligible as independent applicant. This is our so-called territoriality principle. So, what can you apply for? Of course, as an independent fellow, you can apply for your own money. There are some fixed salaries. There is a postdoc salary, and there is a senior postdoc salary in case you have at least two years of postdoc experience. And then, of course, you can apply for collaborators, students, PhD students, postdocs, uh, laboratory assistants, and so on and you can apply also for other kinds of money I will talk about later on. The number of reviews you need is two, but with a but. If you apply for more than 400,000 euros, then you need a few more reviewers. So up to 600,000, you need one review more. Up to 800,000, you need two reviews more and in theory, you can apply also for uh, 2,400,000, but in this case, you need 12 reviews, which is quite a lot. And the probability that one or few reviewers are negative is higher, of course. So you can apply for so much money you want, but there are more risks of being rejected in this case. And the, the amount of time we need to process and decide about the fundability of your project is between three and six months with an average of 4.5 about. So this is also a subject of the last part of my talk, but just broadly, what we expect from you, what we expect you to write in a normal, in a standard FWF application. We expect you to write something about the scientific aspects, 
what are the goals, the methods, and so on. We expect you to write something about the people involved in this project. And in the end, of course, we expect you to write something about what do you want from us? What, how much money? For what? So you, you, we expect you to write about the financial aspects of this application. So this is what we expect you to write, and this is what we expect the reviewers to write. So these first four questions are the same for all programs. We expect an evaluation on the scientific quality of the project. We expect an evaluation of the level of innovation of the project, of the methods and feasibility of the project, and the qualification of the people involved in this project. There might or might not be also some additional aspect, ethical aspects and gender related aspects. For most of the programs, uh, for most of the application actually there are not these kind of issues, but if there are, the reviewers have the possibility to, to write something on that. And once they have evaluated these four aspects of the proposal, they end up with a final evaluation and with a mark. I will tell you more about the mark in the next slide, but yeah, we want them also to write a final statement on the project together with the final evaluation. On top of that, if they want, they can add some consideration for the applicant, some suggestion for the implementation of the project. I cannot tell you right now what do they write on this field because this is brand new. So we introduced it now, this year, and we still have not a single review in which we can see what do they write on this part. This is older, some confidential remark for the FWF, Sometimes it is really a confidential remark. I met the applicant at a conference in Munich and uh, she delivered uh, a great talk, so this is something that might identify the reviewer or he or she might write something related to the program. I find the program excellent, I find the program very bad and I will uh, improve it in this or this way. Sometimes they write something which might be useful for the applicant, some overall suggestion and in this case, we ask them to communicate this consideration to the applicant and they agree in general. But in 90% of the cases, they write nothing. So just, this is just an opportunity for them to express something they cannot express in the normal forms we transmit to the applicant. That's it. So what about this uh, assessment, these marks? I go a bit ahead of myself saying that this mark is indicative but not decisive for the final funding decision. Decisive for the final funding decision is the written text. How many strengths, how many weaknesses this project has. Still, we would like the reviewers to give a clear indication. Will they find it? Will they not find it? with which priority, and so on. So, broadly, we think that excellent means that the application belongs to the top 5% of their peers, very good to the top 15%, and these are the final marks we expect for a successful application. Still, they can say that the application is overall good, so there are, of course, merits in this application, but also some small weaknesses. They can write average, so there are, again, some merits, but the weaknesses are even more, and even more significant. Or they can give the catastrophic evaluation of poor, so there is little to save in this application. So this is what they can write on the final mark. We get these two or more than two reviews, we analyze them, we discuss them, and then the FWF ends up with a final decision, which is funding or rejecting. If we reject the proposal, 
we have five categories, five rejection reasons which we use between C1 and C5. So C1 and C2 are the unfortunate cases in which actually the evaluations are very good to excellent. There is little criticism. So in the perfect world, in an ideal world, we would support this project. We would like to support this project. It's just that we don't have enough money. And therefore, these are the kind of budgetary rejection reasons. There are a few of them. So there are some about 60 millions in applied money which go to these categories, C1 and C2. So we are trying to increase the budget of the FWF also, and particularly to cover these cases and to fund, to fund every application which has been very positively evaluated by the reviewers. The C3 and C4 rejection reasons are more classical and we might compare them with minor revision for the C3 and major revisions for the C4. C5 are the unfortunate cases in which for both or for more than the two reviewers, for all the reviewers involved in the reviewing process, there is little to save in this application. There are really catastrophic flaws in this application. And for this rejection reason, which we give very rarely, we give also a ban of 12 months. And it is important to stress that the idea is banned, not the person. So the person cannot apply for the same project within 12 months. But if this person has another idea, comes up with another project, he or she can apply again for the FWF. So this was the standalone project, standalone program. So now a few words about the mobility programs, the Schrodinger and the Meitner. The Schrodinger is our out outgoing program. It's aimed at young postdoc researchers aiming to go abroad to make a new experience. We write young, but actually there is no age limit. You can apply even if you are 70, doesn't matter. There was an age limit. We removed it because of a lot of exceptions. Yes, I'm a bit older, but I did some years in the industry and so on. So in the end, we decided to remove this age limit. And still, the large majority of our applicants are very young. This is the first or at most a second postdoc position of our applicants. And the reason, I guess, is that First of all, if you are young, you are more in need of an ex inexperience abroad, and maybe you are also more flexible. You are less constraints with the family and so on. So still, the large, extremely large majority of our applicants are below 32. So what's the goal? Is the goal is not to kick you out of Austria, quite the contrary. The goal is to send you abroad for a limited period of time, up to two years, to learn something new that you cannot learn in Austria and bring this knowledge back to Austria. So that's good for your career and that's good also, of course, for the Austrian science system. Submissions are on a rolling basis. There are no deadlines. And we have an approval rate of about 40% which is by far the best at the FWF. And there is a reason for that. The reason is that we left the, the program evaluate twice, in 2006 and in 2013, and the evaluations were very positive. We found out that about 60% of the successful applicants got a permanent position 12 years, up to 12 years after the completion of this fellowship in Austria or abroad. So it seems this is a real career boost and therefore we keep the approval rate as high as possible. So if there is a program I always suggest and uh, recommend, 
this is the Schrodinger problem. Also because it's a bit easier to get it. What do you get if, you, if your project has been approved? You get some money. This is a fellowship. So you don't get a funding contract, a working contract. You get just a fellowship to go abroad, plus travel money, plus a lump sum for children, if you have some, of course, and 2,000 euros a year for conference uh, and so on. You also get the opportunity to apply for a return phase. So we really want you to come back and to implement in Austria what you learned abroad. And therefore, you can apply for up to one year of return phase in Austria. And if you get it, you will get a senior postdoc salary, which is a relatively good salary, plus 12,000 euros a year for project-related costs, whatever you need for the project. In the duration, you can stay up to two years abroad, and you can work up to one year in an Austrian institute. So what's specific about this program? First of all, the uh, criteria are similar to the criteria for the standalone project. We need at least two peer-reviewed publications, and we need that you fulfill the territoriality principle so that you are scientifically based in Austria. On top of that, we need the completion of the doctorate. Actually, this is not quite like that. If you plan to finish your doctorate within four to five months after the submission of your application, we accept it. So four to five months, you remember, is the period we need to evaluate your project. So up to five months, we accept the submission, even if you haven't gotten your title. And of course, we need an invitation from a research center, a research institute abroad. We want you to know already where you want to go, and we want these people abroad already to be aware of your research project. So what is specific for this project, which we didn't cover when I described the standalone program? Of course, the reason for the choice of the host abroad. This is an important aspect, and I've seen it in many young postdocs. Sometimes it's like that. There is one or two collaborators of your PhD advisor. You know them. You have already established a contact with them, so you plan to go to them, and then come back to the PhD advisor, which is kind of normal because you already know these people, but sometimes the reviewers see this kind of constellation negatively. They find that you remain kind of in the family. So you cannot really, in this way, expand your knowledge and broaden your range of skills. So therefore, at the end of your PhD or at the beginning of your postdoc career, you should be already able to identify some experts which you might not know yet that well, but still you might find that they are the right person to broaden your horizon, to learn something new. Go to them and don't go necessarily. It might be okay, but you don't have to necessarily go to the friend of your PhD advisor. So think about that because this is an important choice. And actually we see that most of our fellows go to famous people in famous institutes. Cambridge, Oxford, Princeton, MIT, you name it. Of course, there are some people who go to some excellent research centers in Hungary or uh, uh, Slovakia. That happens, but in most of the cases, they go to big shots abroad to the States, England, or where there is excellent science. So this is an important aspect. And of course, the other important aspect is the return to Austria, where you want to go back in Austria, and how you plan to implement your new knowledge, your know-how that you got abroad in Austria. So how 
you can improve the state of the art in Austria through your project. So it's important to describe these two aspects, what's good for you and what's good for the science in Austria. And these aspects reflect also to the questions to the reviewers. The first four questions are the same. And then on top of that, we have the question five and six, which are program specific. So we want to know from the reviewers an ev evaluation about the host. How good is the host? Is it suitable for this project? And we want to know something about what brings this project to your career and to the uh, Austrian science in general. This is our outgoing program. The contrary, kind of the contrary, is the incoming Lisa Meitner program. Here, the target group are highly qualified researchers coming from abroad. So there are two possibilities to schemes. Either you are based abroad, again, doesn't matter the nationality. It matters only that you are not already in the Austrian scientific system. Or the other possibility, which is the reintegration, is that you might have studied in Austria, you might have spent some time in Austria, but you have been based for at least four years abroad and you want to come back to Austria. So the ideas are incoming, to attract incoming scientists, but also to reintegrate highly qualified scientists who spend some time abroad. So these are the objectives, and together with them, we would like, of course, to attract people who have been working in different environments, with different techniques, with different ideas, and therefore to import these ideas and techniques in Austria. In this way, also fostering collaborations between Austria and the country of origin of the applicant. So these are the main objectives of the Lisa Meitner program. Again, the submission is on a rolling basis. The approval rate is about 25%. Actually, this year it should be slightly better, about 28%. And what you get is a salary, it's a working contract, a normal working contract, which can be a postdoc or a senior postdoc if you have already two years of postdoc experience. Its duration is two years, fixed, and the requisites are two publications, as usual, uh, the completion of doctorate, which again might be uh, overcome if you plan to get the title within four to five months. And then, of course, you should have an invitation of an institute in Austria. You should have already someone in Austria who wants you to come. And for the prerequisites, we have seen there are these two schemes. One scheme is the incoming scheme. In this case, the prerequisite is the contrary of the territoriality principle we have seen before. So we, want you, we don't want you to be based in Austria. So you should not have worked in the last two years in Austria, or you should not have spent more than three years in the last 10 in Austria. Then you are eligible. Or you have been spending a few years in Austria in the recent past, but you have been staying for more than four years abroad. Then you belong to the reintegration scheme. So if you, fulfill, if you fulfill these prerequisites, you can apply. And in order to apply, you need a co-applicant in Austria. The co-applicant, of course, might support you scientifically, might give you guidance, might introduce you also to the Austrian way of doing science, but he or she should also have a mentoring role, should guide you and give you advice about your career, how to improve and advance your career. And indeed, one of the criteria and one of the specific aspects of these programs is the justification for the choice of this mentor and the possibility 
to advance your career through this program. So, and this again reflects in the questions we ask to the reviewers. There are the usual four questions about scientific quality, innovation, methods, and people involved. And on top of that, we have the suitability of the co-applicant and the importance of this project for your career and also for Austria in general. So what is the brain gain for Austria if we get to you here? And these are, of course, important aspects in the final evaluation of applications for this program. So these were some general broad points on these three uh, programs of the FWF. Now, a few more words on how does an application for the FWF look like? Why does it look like, like that? And also a few words on the decision procedures of the FWF. First of all, the choice of topic is completely up to you. We say nothing, we suggest you nothing, we recommend you nothing. You are a scientist, you decide, or the applicants decide, what they want to do. If they apply for a uh, program of the FWF. The only requisite is that the type of research, as I said, is basic research. There should be something innovative. This, the result of this project should increase our knowledge about the world, about this field of research in general. And I've discussed about the eligibility. And as I said, for most of the programs, the criteria are at least two peer-reviewed publications and the fulfillment of the ter territoriality principle. In your description of the research projects, as I said, there are three aspects to take care of. Scientific aspects, uh, people involved, and the money you request. So a few more details about the scientific aspects. You want, we want you to describe the goals, the objectives of your research, what you plan to do with this research. And this is, of course, an important point. We don't want you just to collect data in general or to do what some reviewers uh, define fishing expedition. We want you to clearly identify some scientific question and investigate them with the scientific method, nothing else. Uh, the level of originality, we want you to describe them. This was always an important point for the FWF, but as you have seen in the questions for the reviewers, now it is explicitly asked that the reviewers evaluate the level of innovation of this project. How relevant is this project for the field? What are the methods involved? What are the collaborations you plan to uh, establish in order to reach the goals of these model methods? Of course, in most of the cases, you cannot do everything alone. So you should seek collaborator, uh, collaboration with people in Austria or abroad. Abroad work and time plan that can be provisional, but still we would like you to have an idea on how and on which timescales to reach the goals of your project. And then, if applicable, in most of the cases it's not applicable, we want you to think about possible ethical and gender-related aspects. The second part is about human resources. We just would like you to describe what competence you and your collaborators are, why you and your collaborators are the right people for this kind of project. And then there are the financial aspects, which are broadly divided into two categories. We would like to know what's available in your Austrian institute in terms of infrastructure and of people working on this field or on similar topics. And then we would like to, 
we would like to know what do you request, what do you need financially to reach the goals of your project? How many people do you want us to support? If there is some travel money you request, uh, consumables, instruments, whatever you need, you put it here. And I guess I don't have to go into detail of the specific forms and limitations. The broad idea is simply that we would like the reviewers to have every possible information they need in order to evaluate your project, but not more. And in particular, we don't want the reviewers to get a book like that, and uh, for sure they will say no, that they, want to, they don't want to evaluate that. So we try to limit the number of pages they get. And we think that 20 pages for the project description is still quite generous. You can write quite a lot in 20 pages. And then there are some additional requirements. We want to see your full list of publications, and there might be some aspects you might or might not consider, or you might or might not send us. For instance, an interesting point is that you can exclude up to three reviewers. If you know that there are some people who has some different opinion on some scientific topics, or uh, is working on your same field, so you see him or her as a, comp as a competitor, you can exclude up to three names. And we will take that into account, of course. We will not contact them. So, what are, in general, the aspects to pay attention to? I, of course, have a bias of the FWF applications, but I guess, and I hope, that most of these, po these points apply in general for applications for all funding schemes and agencies. So a key point is, of course, the state of the art. Enthusiasm among reviewers simply means that uh, you know that you are writing not for lay people, but for experts. So try to convince experts that your research is worth doing. The state of the art. The state of the art is, of course, important because reviewers want to see that you are able to position you and your project within the state of the art. What is known, what is non, not known, what are the knowledge, knowledge gaps, how your project can fill these knowledge, knowledge gaps. A complete description of the state of the art is equally important because if you think about it, the reviewers are human, they are not machines, and they might be narcissists as any human being. So they want to see their name in their application. So sometimes they write, the state of the art is not complete, but what they really mean is that I don't see my name here. And uh, of course, this is bad. This is not the worst criticism you can get, but still it's a criticism. Uh, about the clearly defined questions and hypotheses, I discuss a little bit, but this is an important point. We are scientists. We work with the scientific methods, and the reviewers want to see that, want to see clear scientific questions and a clear path of verifying a possible hypothesis about your research topic. So if you phrase your research like that, I have an idea, I have a question I would like to answer, I have an hypothesis I would like to test. And this is the path to test the hypothesis through some experiments or whatever. They love it. But this is the usual way of doing science, so I guess you know that. But generally, if the board of the FWF sees a criticism, this is a fishing expedition, this is bad. This can be really a killer argument. Presentation of preliminary research that can or cannot be important. Actually, for our programs in the career development, usually these are young people coming up with, with, with the real first scientific idea. So sometimes they don't have enough preliminary results. But in some case, it is important to show that you know already what to do, that you have already produced some interesting results you can build up on, 
And therefore, that increases the confidence of the reviewers that you can achieve your goals. Of course, you have to describe also the level of innovation, which was always an important point for the FWF. And as I said, now it's even more important because we directly ask the reviewers to evaluate the level of innovation of your project. Methods and work plan. Of course, you cannot describe everything. We don't expect you to describe everything, also because there are some page limitations. But still, the reviewers want to see that you know how to reach the goals. At least you know the path. And particularly, what I find very important is that the reviewers want to see whether you know what to do if something goes wrong. So the contingency plans, the plan B, or whatever you want to call it, is usually very well received by the reviewers. So think about it. What happens if this step doesn't work as planned? What happens if, I don't know, this experiment fails, and so on? This, I think, is always an important point. The required expertise is, particularly for us, very important. So for the career development programs. We want to know, and actually the reviewers want to know, that you are the right person for this project. This project might be great. These ideas can be great. The methods can be perfect. But maybe you have been placed in the wrong project. You should do something different. I've seen something like that. And of course, I mean, the board takes that uh, seriously. The project is great, but this is not the right person for this project that can really be a killer argument. Justification of the cost, that can be important, but this is not a killer argument. Neither is a killer argument a comprehensible English, also because what I see, the level of English of the applications I read is already excellent. Still, if you have some native speaker, or if you have some colleague with a good command of English, it's always a good idea to give him or her the application to, for a check. And in general, it's always a good idea that someone else checks your application and see whether it is complete, whether it's clear what are the goals, what are the hypotheses, what are the steps to reach these goals, and so on. He or she might not be an expert in this field, but that doesn't matter. These clear aspects uh, level of innovation, goals, hypotheses, and so on. Everybody, every, every science can get them. And even if they are not exactly expert in this field. So if, if you have this opportunity, give your application to a colleague before you submit it. And these are aspects to consider, but also some uh, criticism we see very often in our reviews. So it's worth thinking about them. So a few words about our decision procedures. In the end, you have written the application. We send it to the reviewers. We got the reviews. What happens afterwards? Just a few words. First of all, some key points. We have a strict bottom-up principle. We really leave you the complete freedom on the topic of your research. Still, it might happen that you propose a research on the sex of the angels, and the reviewers think that this topic is not really central. It's not the most important topic in the present research. That can happen, but still, we say nothing about the topic of your research. Multiple checks means that I personally decide nothing, and I do nothing. I'm collaborating with other people in the FWF office, and I closely collaborate with the board of the FWF in order to reach each decision and to proceed with each step towards the final decision. And we try to be as transparent as possible with the applicants. We really, we really give everything we can to them, and the usual suggestion is always to call us if there is something unclear. Also with the final decision, you have seen, as a final decision, you get a, a standardized answer. If you want some more detail, call us or call the reporters 
so you will get some more feedback on the reason why your application has been rejected. Uh, I told that already. There are marks, but the marks are mostly indicative. They are not decisive. What is decisive for the final decision is the text in the application. How many strings there are in this application, how many weaknesses, how important, how significant are the strengths, how significant are the weaknesses, does this project fit to the aims of the, fro of the program, and so on. So we try to critically evaluate all the strengths and weaknesses we come up with a suggestion. The board of the app FWF discusses and compares all the application, and they come up with the final decision. So these are the key points. To go a bit more in detail, the quality benchmark is the international scientific community. This is something I've seen, unfortunately. There are reviewers who write, that's OK. You can find it. You can give him money to him or to her, but I would like to point out that in my country, we will not find it. That's not excellent enough for our country. We don't like that. We don't like to be a second league in the scientific arena. We would like your application to be internationally competitive at the highest level. All reviews are based abroad. That is something we changed in 2000, I think. Earlier, it was possible to have reviewers also from Austria, but it was, we found out that Austria is too small. Half of the possible reviewers are your enemies. Half of the possible reviewers are your friends. So we had no possibility to get an independent evaluation. That was really a disaster. And therefore, from them on, it is possible to get only reviewers from abroad. And we have five boards per year, five board meetings per year. The next is in two weeks, which is quite some time, but my deadline for my projects is in two days. So once I will leave here, I will have a pile of application to take care of. And uh, as a justification for the final decision, you will get the reviews. Doesn't matter when, whether your application has been approved or rejected, you will get the reviews as a justification. And if you need some more information, as I said, call us. Don't be shy, we are here for you. And to finish, just a few words on how we choose the reviewers. The reviewers should be at the same scientific level, more or less, of the applicant. So we then task a PhD student to evaluate an application of Anton Zeilinger. And uh, I guess this makes more or less sense. It might be funny to see a PhD student evaluating Zalinger, but we don't do that. And we don't have a fixed pool of reviewers. We always choose reviewers who are appropriate for this application. And this is the result that 90% of our reviewers never reviewed an application for the FWF before. They might have some experience with other agencies, but they are usually new to the FWF. We try to distribute them regionally, but still some 30 to 40% of the reviewers come from the states. That's, it's like that. They are, more, they are more famous, and they usually accept to review application for the FWF. That is something that also I notice in my work. I have two Nobel Prizes that accepted to review an application for young applicants for the FWF. That's a nice thing. And they took time to write a proper review. And uh, we tried to increase the number of female uh, reviewing applications. We are at about 30% and we would like to increase that more. In some disciplines, that is very easy. In some disciplines, it's less easy, it's a bit more complicated, but we do our best to increase also the, the fraction of women. And as I said, there is the possibility to exclude a few reviewers. In some disciplines, it might be complicated because the field is really small, so we try to broaden a bit the horizon in order to find proper reviewers. 
The abstract, in case you apply, this is an important point. The abstract is the only information the reviewers get. So they read their, your name, they read the abstract, and they have to decide whether to review this application or not. So the suggestion is always to take some time to write a sexy abstract in such a way that we get soon reviewers accepting to review the application and we get a decision earlier on. And we do our best to evaluate all possible biases, but we cannot check everything and therefore we want and we demand that the reviewers also sign a declaration of not conflict of interest. And that's actually it. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, so we cover quite some ground. Maybe there is still something not that clear and therefore we have some time for questions, right? Otherwise, as I said, just call me, contact me for any other question. We are here for the applicants actually. So thanks a lot. So is there any questions from the audience? Yeah. Hi, I have a question. If you apply for a standalone as a postdoc at a university in Austria, and at the moment you're applying for a position elsewhere and you move away from Austria, is there a way to keep the project running here or do you have to transfer it to someone else to be PI? You have both possibilities. We have one scheme that is called Money Follow Researcher, which is exactly aimed at that. We don't want this competence and this project to get lost. But still, if you can suggest someone to replace you as a principal investigator for this project, you can do that as well. The only point is that for this kind of strange situation, particular situation, there is always a board of the FWF directors which might be involved. So you send an application for money follow researcher or for change of the project investigator and the board discussed about that, but they are really they accept this kind of situation always, or almost always. Okay. Thanks for your clear outline. I have two questions. First of all, how do you um, evaluate this terri territorial uh, principle? Uh, you send us the CV and we check that. Okay. But I mean, it's not based on that. You have to give some, I don't know, documents. Or no, 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 no. Okay. We, we we trust you. Okay. We fully trust you. <laughs> And my second question is just how, how, how do you find, the, do you have to state also the area where, which you place your topic in or you find this out or how do you get the, like, how general or not general do you have to place your proposed uh, So there, there is uh, in the form for the application, there are some categories. So you place your categories, your project might be 40% artificial intelligence, 40% uh, technology, 20% uh, organic chemistry, I don't know. And this is uh, the way for us. And on top of that, of course, we read the application to place it, to assign it to the right reporters and in order to assign it from the reporters to assign it to the right reviewers. Uh, hi, thanks a lot for this practical information. Uh, so for the standalone project, how, how much competitive it is and what is the success rate, uh, especially if we compare it with other uh, very popular grants like the MC Individual Fellowship? So Thanks. the success rate is about 27%. It's more or less the same for most of the programs, with the exception of the Schrodinger, which, as I said, has a success rate of about 40%. So it's uh, kind of stable in the last 10 years with a slight trend, slight increase in trend. So I think it's okay. So we are still uh, finding projects which are really competitive. 
And uh, we still, we only have this situation in which sometimes we have to give this C1 and C2, which are rejections, but just budgetary rejections. These are the so-called approved, but not funded projects. And uh, we would like to solve this kind of situation. Otherwise, I think we cannot complain that much, also in comparison with uh, Marie Curie, for instance, about the approval rate. Thank you. About the START program, is it uh, a prerequisite to have an invitation from an Austrian university to apply? Uh, yes, in the sense that there is uh, a form to sign from the director of the Austrian Institute in which they state that you can do your own research, you can publish under your own name and so on. But that's it. Otherwise, you are responsible for your research. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you for your presentation. And I have a question about Lisa Meitner Fellowship. So they have the territorial principle. So for example, if you are working for one year in Austria only, can you still apply for it? Yes, you can. Up to two years, you can apply. So you can work uh, one year, 11 months, 30 days, but at the moment of the submission, you are still working for less than two years, you are eligible. Actually, we are also a bit more tolerant. If you, work for, if you have been working for two years and two days and you submit your application, that's fine. Hello, I have a question um, to the Lisa Meitner um, funding scheme. With respect to the level of innovation, so if, for example, a researcher would have two potential project ideas, one is highly innovative, but uh, the person hasn't published anything um, to in this area, or the other would be that um, it's not that innovative, but the person already has published some articles in that area, what's the better strategy to go for? I mean. It's really difficult to say because we have a, a question to the reviewers about the level of innovation and a question to the reviewers about your qualification for this project. And of course, there, there is a balance you have to strike. What I can say is always that uh, there is a mentor, a co-applicant, and of course, if there is something new for you, but not new for the co-applicant, that's still good. So you might be still able to describe your role in the project and to say that you are the right person for this project because of, of your previous experience. Of course, you don't have specific knowledge on this topic, but the co-applicant has it. And therefore, you can try to argument like that. But otherwise, I mean, it's a balance you have to strike. You have to discuss with your collaborators and try to find a compromise. It's something that I cannot answer so easily. Uh, is there a repository for a successful application that we could uh, check? You can check the names of the successful applicants. You can check the abstracts. You can check some basic facts, but not the application. The only opportunity you have to see real applications is during the coaching workshops, which is something that most of I participated to, which, yeah, you can check the dates for the coaching workshops and, uh, yeah, in this case, you see real applications. Okay. Otherwise, we are not allowed to give them. Uh, and yeah. also, could you... You can, you can basically, you will not only see the applications, but also review them as a reviewer if you do the coaching workshop. So, as a reviewer, you can see what are the pros and cons. However, you cannot take those applications because remember, FWF is the funding institution. So, they cannot give you the application. You can ask to the, probably the applicant. Mm -hmm. And I have another question whether you can briefly comment on the female specific uh, postdoc uh, fellowship? Uh, yes. So, of course, it's always a question. Should the female scientists have their own projects or their own uh, uh, reserve money, or should they be competitive also with the male scientists? We do find that particular for young female scientists, maybe after a maternity leave or something like that, there's still 
need for some support. And therefore, we introduced these programs, Richter and Fierberg. So we find it useful, at least at the beginning of the career of a female scientist, but there is no program for, uh, adv uh, for advanced scientists, female scientists. Still, I can anticipate that uh, so 2020 it will be business as usual, but probably we will change something starting from 2021. And the something we will change probably will involve also the female programs, which doesn't mean that we will suppress them. We will actually like to increase the money devoted to science for female scientists. When you mentioned that two peer-reviewed publications are required, are these first other publications? Uh, that's interesting because it used to be like that, but uh, with the last guidelines, which are online this year, we removed this uh, requirement. So the only requirement is that your contribution should be highlighted. What is your contribution to this publication? That's it. Otherwise, still, even if you don't have first authorships, you are eligible. Hello, um, I'd like to ask if you, uh, for a female scientist who's taken some time off, so like a career break or something, but decide to go for a regular grant application, um, would this period of time off be taken into account, for example, in this requirement of having publications in the last five years? Could this be extended to seven years or eight, something like that? Yes, so that's a good point. So we do take this, that into account. So we require two publications in, in the last five years, but if you have having uh, many career breaks, for instance, maternity leaves and so on, we go back. So we fish back the publications until, yeah. Hopefully you have the two publications in the last five active years. And we also send, together with the forms for the reviewers, a declaration that they should take your academic age, including possible breaks into account in their evaluation. So that's clearly stated, and actually most of our uh, reviewers comply to that. They take them into account. There are cases in which they don't take them into account, but for that, we have these multiple checks. I check whether they take them to into account. If I miss this point, the reporter might check that, and so on. So this is not a risk. How do you consider papers under revision? Sometimes in biology, for example, it can take really long. And the, we don't. Uh, I'm sorry, we don't. So we consider only published or accepted peer-reviewed publications. So if it's accepted but not yet published, that's okay, but not under revision. Still, I mean, if it's uh, on uh, Astro PH archive, you might indicate them, and uh, maybe the reviewers would like to see what kind of publication, uh, publication is it, and uh, that might be in a positive aspect, but for our eligibility criteria, we don't take them into account. Thanks for the talk. So I have a question regarding the standalone projects. You mentioned the requirement of two years, so being based in Austria for two years at the moment of the application, of submitting the application. I would like to know how flexible is this, and I don't know if it's possible, for example, Considering that it takes four or five months to, to review the, the application, maybe if it's possible to apply after one year and a half or what? No, actually How we flexible are, is this? No, we, we, we don't accept that. So, it's, okay. it's, so it should be strictly it's two, two years? It should be two years. But I mean, the positive aspect of that is that if you are not eligible for the standalone, then that, that means that you are eligible for the Meitner. Lisa Meitner, yeah. yeah. Super, thanks. I wanted to ask you, what about the outcomes from the grant? Do you require them to be open access? Like, are you following the European Union on the EU? Yeah, we guidelines? do. And actually, we support 
publications only if there are open access. There are a few exceptions. The applicants might argue that on this topic, uh, the best journals are not open access. We accept that. Still, we fund and support financially only open access publications. But it's not an obligation. Yep. It's not an obligation to publish open access. It is? It yeah, is? yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. At least for some journals, not for all. Yeah. Mm. Uh, just have a quick question. Do you also accept uh, like peer-reviewed conference papers? As yes, yes, uh, sure. Okay. Important is that it's peer-reviewed. Mm. And some disciplines like informatics, uh, sometimes conference papers are more important than journal papers. So. Okay. Considering the long reviewing process, would you recommend to send the same project proposal? proposal to different funding agencies at the same time? Uh, yes, you can send the proposal to different funding agencies. Important is that you let us know about that. So there is a field in the application form in which you can give indication on different application for different funding agencies. And of course, you should let us, let us know also the results of this evaluation for different funding agencies. Otherwise, everything is possible. And of course, it's always a good idea to try different ways to get the proposal funded. Hi, I have a question regarding the starting program. For, to apply for the starting program, you have to be resident in Austria? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, yes, so the, there is the Actually, we don't apply the classical territoriality principle. So you should be based in Austria. The project should be found in Austria, but we don't apply the classical territoriality principle. Uh, so I, I don't care about the, I, I don't deal with the, the start program. For detailed questions about the start program, the person is Mario Mandel, M-A-N-D-L. But yeah, we don't apply the classical territoriality principle for the start.